Only now, both in the cosmological scale and in the scale of black holes, and neutron stars are probing the theory in regimes where pretty much every uh, natural combination of quantities gives you one, like mass over R is order one for black holes, the velocities at which these objects are colliding with each other is order, order C, and if anything might show up to show the partial par par general relativity, well, these are the ideal systems. We should try and understand better what we're trying to do. If we're gonna say at some point, we think there is something that is odd with respect to general relativity. So I'll give you a, a bit of a brief motivation, um, and then give you some general comments uh, on modifications of uh, Einstein gravity. And here I'm gonna get myself into a lot of trouble because there are many, many theories out there, many good ideas, but I'm gonna dig myself into a hole that is gonna be very depressing. My initial message will be, we really don't know what we're doing. Most of these theories, if not essentially all, make no sense. Yet, the building, the building blocks of those theories are interesting, and we want to use some of that to probe some fundamental ideas. And I'll try, kind of rescue ourselves out of that hole, and then try to see how we could go about moving forward. And in the process, I'll just motivate with a few theories, uh, just the points I'm trying to make. So, but at the very beginning, we should be honest to ourselves. I said, why do we even go beyond Einstein? We have we gotten any clue whatsoever um, of something that is telling us maybe, maybe there is another theory. Of course, ultimately, we don't know that there is a quantum theory of gravity that someone eventually will try and get, um, and, which is not general relativity. So we should eventually find another theory. But by and large, on, on, Essentially, all tests that we have had at our disposal today, including the collision of black holes, tell us generativity rules the rules day. Why are we going to go and entertain some possible ideas? In the previous talk, there was this very interesting tension about the masses of neutrinos and all the other particles. So there's something that kind of compels you to say, well, there is something fishy here. We don't have that yet. We have a promise of quantum gravity, but it's a scale so much further away from what we can probe then maybe we don't have really the right to go there. On the other hand, we have the cosmological constant, we have dark matter, things that are sufficiently annoying, and in principle, there is a possibility that maybe it's not a particle, maybe it's the dark matter is reality, in reality it's something else, it's on the left-hand side of the equations that is modifying things, and in the regime we're probing, it looks like a particle, or it looks like dark energy, so who knows? From that point of view, it's always interesting to try and, and explore those ideas, if that's uh, something that you like to do. Because there are many theories, uh, there is, and uh, reasons I'll describe later, there are very few predictions of what to do, what to look for, if you're gonna look for deviation of general relativity. There are, as I said, there are many, many theories, and very few studies in depth that tells us, if this is a theory, this is what you should be looking for, go try and measure in LIGO and use either that to claim an observation or put a significant constraint on that particular theory. I'll tell you why we have significant roadblocks to have those kind of predictions and then what to do uh, moving forward. Today, the most sensible uh, approach that LIGO has in some sense is to try, say, let's go and look for the gravitational waves, find the best match that we have from general activity, and then ask, is there anything left? Is there a residual? Compare your best prediction, subtract, and then ask what's there, something that particle physicists have been doing forever to try and, and explore for new phenomena. General relativity or gravitational wave uh, science is just beginning to do that. And in cosmology, this has been uh, ongoing for a few decades, and I'm gonna just pause and, and, and also point a few things that also we need to understand better. So um, here, so, no, these are already said, well, we have to always be careful in, there is, there is always a possibility that we can, as a theorist, we can always invent problems that we can solve and then we'll keep us happy or busy for a while. We really want to know what's fundamental about the theory or not. And even from the point of view of general relativity, we have a metric tensor describing gravitational interactions. In principle, and this also uh, kind of, there is a, a connection with the previous talk, in principle, that metric tensor could have up to six propagation degrees of freedom, but we know that generative only has two because the graviton is massless. But who knows, maybe, maybe there is a small relic, maybe the graviton has a tiny bit of mass, maybe there are some extra polarization that we can go and, and, and uh, go after in, with the gravitational wave experiments. 
So today, what you do is, okay, you take a signal, this is GW150914, this is the strongest signal so far, you match with the best possible general relativity templates, and then you try to say how we can go and look for possible deviations in, uh, in, an, external, in an additional theory. And I want to introduce something that, so this is a, a rehash of a talk that we got uh, given together with Franz Pretorius and myself in, in different venues. We, I like to first try and motivate or a distinction between two different set of theories or two different set of ideas we could, we could imagine uh, considering. We could say, well, write whatever or grab whatever modified theory of gravity you want or write one, and you're gonna call that interesting if it is consistent with all tests that we have so far available at our disposal, disposal um, but predict some observable differences in the strong field regime. If that's the case, well, this is interesting because it's something you can go and test. If it predicts no deviations, then, okay, what else are you gonna do with that? Uh, Occam's razor would tell generativity will always rule the day. But in addition to that, we may actually want a theory to be viable. And by viable, I mean a theory that you can actually solve. You can ask for what's the behavior of a system governed by such a theory. And this is where, we're, where our most fundamental impediment are. I'm gonna claim that essentially all but a very, very small subset, and I'm gonna joke, it's a set of measure zero. Uh, all theories that people have written are not viable from a mathematical point of view. And the mathematical point of view is the following. You need to be able to set up an initial value problem, give consistent initial data, and ask the question, what's gonna to happen to the future of it? And that's where most theories die. So maybe I can finish my talk and we go for a coffee because that's, that's the end of it. Well, this is where the hole I've dug myself into, and then I'm gonna to try to give you some hope. Because after all, even general relativity itself has predictions. We know that general relativity, if you have flat space-time, perturb it a little bit, we have the celebrated kleinerman Christodoulou theorem that says we recover uh, flat space-time again. We also have the singularity theorems, and that, which says in particular initial configurations, a black hole or a singularity will always form, and if cosmic censorship is true, it will always be hidden inside event horizon. So maybe many of these theories that at first sight, rigorously, mathematically speaking, will be doomed, they will be doomed within some certain initial conditions, and maybe in other conditions, this version will win and will give us some well-defined initial boundary value problem. So we need to understand that. And we need to understand the problems that we'll have to face at the numerical, at the nonlinear regime to try and assess that possibility. So, for instance, if you're gonna, I'm gonna discuss some of these things, but generically, if you want to consider modifying GR or modifying something that may reflect itself as deviations uh, that, say, LIGO or uh, cosmological pros may see, you have different choices. So one is, you could imagine coupling gravity in a different way to matter. And I'll show you some examples. You could imagine modifying the geometry, that is modifying, say, the left-hand side of the equations, not the matter, but the left-hand side. Or you could imagine modifying the right-hand side. These are, for instance, you can imagine creating exotic alternatives to black holes. People have coined, like, Gravastar, fastballs, and many interesting uh, potential counterparts or alternatives to black holes. I tend to call them all except one, crap of stars. And I really mean the crap because they don't have, it's still an initial value problem. I cannot take a gravastar star and say, how did this gravastar star form dynamically and how stable it is? That I cannot do today. I, for, by using very little imagination, most of these theories I said before, I call them crap of theories for the same reasons. I cannot ask in the nonlinear regime, how will this theory uh, behave unless I do something special to them. And I, hopefully I'll be uh, sufficiently careful in my explanation by those two crappa names. I mean no disrespect whatsoever. I think they're very interesting ideas, but I just want to push those that develop these ideas to tell them, look, there is a lot more uh, effort that needs to be invested for us on the prediction front to try and do something with your theory. I also want to stress very strongly this quote by uh, Ulam. Most of calculation, most of studies that have been done in this regime have been assuming our perturbations with respect to some uh, particular solution, so these are linear studies. And by and large, linear studies have ruled physics in the 19th and 20th century. 
but the century has changed. We're in the 21st century. We should start thinking that, well, maybe we just keep looking at the elephant and we're trying to, by learning well about the elephant, say something about a little mouse. More than one, in more than one occasion, our linear intuition is going to take us the wrong direction. I'll give you a very simple example. Take Navier Stokes, linearize them, you just throw away turbulence. And turbulence is ubiquitous. So we need to make sure that we have the right tools to analyze what happened in the nonlinear regime. And I always joke, like we, we heard in the first talk this morning, uh, Green was saying, well, I don't use Mathematica, but I have collaborators that do. So especially for the young people in the audience, I kind of, I'm very kind of in a very uh, uh, bad scene of ageism. Like if you're over 50 and you tell me you don't use Mathematica, I'm fine. If you're over 30 and you don't use Mathematica, I'm not. And if you're over 20 and you, don't, and you cannot use computers to solve some of these equations, I'm going to tell you this is like trying to fight a fight with a, tie, with a hand tied up behind your back. Make sure you do know how to use computers at your disposal. Because there are many questions where if you do know how to use them, you may be the only ones able to uh, answer. So let me just give you an example of this, this small subset of theories that actually have an initial, a well-defined initial boundary value problem. You can use them to uh, give precise predictions. And also, by doing these numerical simulations, you can show that there were lots of interesting phenomenology, phenomenology that people have missed because the only studies that were done, done at that point were linear studies. So imagine this theory. So you've seen, even at the very first talk this morning, to the leading order, the Lagrangian, for instance, equation, for instance, theory is just a Ricci. But consider adding further fields coupled in a way, so these are the matter fields, that are kind of conformal to that metric tensor. And then you ask, what will the phenomenology in this theory be? Well, it turns out there is an instability that will make this field grow to some non-zero value if the matter happens to be compact enough. So for a system like the sol the plant, this, uh, our solar system, uh, there is no difference whatsoever. The sun, the earth, the moon are not sufficiently dense to trigger this instability. But a neutron star is. And if a neutron star of sufficiently small compaction were to, sufficiently high compaction were to exist, it will trigger instability. And the dynamics of the theory will be significantly different close to the merger of, black, of neutron stars um, that LIGO will see. That is true. And there is one of the things that that theory has, in particular, is dipole radiation. So in general relativity, energy gets lost at the quadrupole order. In this theory, dipole radiation takes energy from the system in a very efficient manner. And this is why uh, the neutron stars will come and hit each other at much stronger speed. And the rate at which it does so is much higher than that from general relativity. Nonlinear studies pointed out that there was another interesting phenomena. Even when you could have two different stars with two different masses, which the linear studies will predict will have different effects. As these stars are getting closer and closer to each other, there is a feedback, a nonlinear feedback mechanism that eventually matches the effective charges, the scattered new charges in these two stars, regardless of what their initial, the individual masses are. And that shuts off dipole radiation. So you could go to a system, in this, in this scenario, where at very far distances, things behave like in GR. They get closer. They behave very different from GR. And as they get even closer, they go back to behaving like general relativity, except with a different set of masses. That's very bizarre, but that's something that the theory had um, naturally incorporated. And this is such a theory. It's a theory that is well beha behaved, and you can put it in a computer and ask for interesting questions. So now you say, well, but that's a very limited range. In, that, in those theories, nothing changes for black holes, so that's unfortunate because LIGO gets to see, LIGO and Virgo gets to see more often, much more often black holes, binaries, and binary neutral stars. Also, for the same, the, the, the one binary neutral star that we think we know of, this GW170 or A17, uh, the masses and the uh, estimated compactions are not so high to have triggered instability. So maybe while it is interesting, it's not telling us of a very clear smoking gun for testing these theories. Another set of theories that contains these theories that I mentioned is this thing called Kornesky's theories. This is a theorem that says, suppose you want to insist that your uh, theory that is an extension of general relativity contains equations of motion that are only of second order type. What's the most general Lagrangian you can think of writing? 
that includes only one extra degrees of freedom, and then this is this one, which is beautiful. And it's used, it has been used a lot in the context of, of cosmology. Let me just give you one example. This x happen to do with is the gradient of the scatter field. It's related to the gradient of the scatter field. Suppose you're in a situation where the potential is such that it takes the evolution of this field that could have taken an initial value that is arbitrary to an attractor that has this gradient be constant. So you, all these extra terms will go away, essentially, and then you have r plus x. Now call that x, which is a constant lambda, and lo and behold, you have a, a theory that is just now giving you a natural explanation, dynamical explanation for a cosmological constant. That's just a very simple example of why people uh, explore kind of these theories. But if you write the equations and motions of these theories, they are a royal mess. And furthermore, very recently, because of that messiness, people have never asked the question, are these, th these theories well-defined, i.e., can you define an initial value problem for these theories and evolve it in a natural way? So Papalo and Real, uh, a few years ago, looked into that, and their conclusion was, even at the linear level, you can prove that unless G4 and G5, which kills all these, is equal to zero, these theories are dead on arrival. In spite of lots of papers, lots of effort, lots of uh, results out there, where people have done linearized studies with respect to a particular solution, which is Freeman, Robinson, Walker. So you take FRW, you expand that, and you get something that looks sensible, because you're expanding over a very, very particular solution. And maybe that's fine. But we have to remember that if we're not close enough to an FRW, we don't know what these theories are going to do. In fact, generically, they are going to just give us nonsense. But that was in the linear regime. And uh, very quickly, people pointed out that Papal and Real use a very special frame to do this calculation. Um, maybe this is a very, was a, a, a byproduct of having chosen a particular gauge, this frame, could be this maybe regarded, uh, could these arguments regard the analysis as too restrictive? Yes. No. That's right. So let me just simplify. I'm going to throw a whole bunch of, the, of, of, of those uh, uh, quantities to zero. I'm going to only going to allow for G4 and G2 be non-zero. If you write the equations of motion, OK, they look messy. Let me not show you this. I'll point out uh, a different way of writing. And you can do a conformal transformation, and the equations look like this. So Einstein's equations look exactly, or the equations for the metric tensor is exactly like the one in GR with a very sane right-hand side. So everything is fine there. The problem is the equation of motion for the scalar field. So the scalar field is obeying an equation. Just forget about all this extra mess. Here is the box equation. So it's just saying the, the box of phi equal to something. And then it has modifications that depend on the gradient of the scalar field itself. The moment you see this, the standard mathematical theory of partial differential equations tell you propagation speed are, are no longer those of the, of the speed of light, say, in that theory. Worse yet, the propagation speeds will be modified in a way that depends on the gradient of the, of the field itself, which will induce shocks. So these shocks, now we're saying we have a theory that will produce shocks. So in shocks, characteristics cross. And in order to find out the unique solution after the, the, the shock crossing uh, or the characteristics crossing, we need further conditions. So already, that's giving us a big red flag that we have to worry about. Of course, we can still use this equation that is highly nonlinear and ask the question, what happens in the nonlinear regime if my initial configuration is such that is in the so-called small data regime. So it's very similar to the theorem of the stability of Minkowski in general relativity. If you say this, my initial data is small, but in studying the evolution from the full nonlinear point of view, you can conclude using uh, the Kreisler and Kahneman uh, theory that Minkowski is, flat, Minkowski is uh, stable. The same thing you can do here. So this was an example of a theory that, in, pr in principle, from a general point of view, is nonsensical. And I'll show you even more deeply how nonsensical it is. But in the right corner, it might be just perfectly fine. The question is whether well, that's the right corner for the physics we want to do. So what's the problem? Let me not tell you exactly this. I'll give you an example. Think of these equations. These are two equations. And imagine that y. Think of y as t. There is a reason why I haven't uh, called it t. 
uh, which you'll see in a second. Imagine that here you have y going this way and x is a space. This is one plus one problem. Or you can have this one and then write this equation or that equation. This equation is hyperbolic when y is negative. But when y is positive, then it turns to elliptic. So this is an example of an equation that was hyperbolic. Initially, everything seemed fine, but now, now it's elliptic. And how do we even solve that problem? It's not clear, except I'll give you an example of how bad the situation is. So this is an example where the velocity, so the velocities of propagation go to zero. But you can also, we could have written this equation, which is 1 over y. The velocities go to infinity here and then change signs. So it's elliptic here, hyperbolic here. But one, the, the propagation speeds went to zero and then changed sign. The other ones went to infinity and came back from the other side. The system I already told you exhibits both these problems. How bad are these problems? Well, luckily, OK, some mathematician, whatever, study the case, the simplest case, the case where the velocities went to zero. So you imagine, well, we're physicists. Maybe we know better. I don't care if things go kind of iffy at some point, because it only go point at y, bad at y equals 0. If this is elliptic, one I could imagine putting boundary conditions here and thinking that maybe there is a solution to this problem. Well, that's what Morao is this for us. I mean, there is this, this theorem that shows if you can have a unique, well-behaved solution of that problem, the conditions you have to give are the elliptic, the boundary conditions here, whatever you want here on a characteristic, say, and you're not allowed to give this data. This is very strange. So it's like the future is determined what should have been the past for the solution to actually be uh, unique and well-behaved. This is, if we're not um, worried about this, I don't know what's going to worry us. Of course, what mediates this problem? Well, we go back to the equation. And it's the gradient of the scalar fields. And so we say, well, if the gradient gets to be large, if uh, the wavelengths that we're exploring is very, very short, then we're going to run into this problem earlier. So the natural, especially um, the message that comes from particle physics often is, well, we have dealt with this before. We know this, these problems, and this has to do with the effective way of looking at the theory. It's just telling you you're go going away from your theory. There is a domain of applicability of your expansion, and as a result, Maybe the evolution takes you away from it, and then at some point you cannot say anything. And that's perfectly fine. Um, the argument would be, well, if you actually start with initial conditions that are very restricted to the regime where it should be fine, maybe that's where you could, we could explore this theory. The problem is that all these theories are nonlinear. You're going to put them in a computer. And in a computer, you might choose your data to be within this regime of data that is fine, but your numerics is feeding energy, even ever so slightly, at all possible frequencies. So while you may be thinking that this, you put data here where everything should be fine, well, there is a piece over there that is going to take you to hell. And now we have to find a way to deal with that. And this, so this is a very practical ad hoc problem, but somehow we need to address it. And I'll tell you how we could do that in a second. Um, so I already discussed this. So let's say that was second order. And there was a very strong reason why people why, why a camp of theorists never wanted to go beyond second order. And that's because there are some very well-known instabilities called Ostrograski's instabilities, which have to do with higher time derivatives in your problem. So that was a very good reason to just try to stick in second order, uh, to second order. But I already told you that by and large, those theories have pathologies. So we can put a pause on that and then say, well, what if we want to go beyond second order? Maybe uh, there is phenomenology that we want to study. Maybe we don't have a good enough control of the physics we want to add. There is actually a very powerful technique that we have used in, th in theoretical in physics for a long time, which is this effective field theory uh, approach, where you think that maybe your theory has a whole bunch of extra degrees of freedom, but they act at a, more, at a much smaller scale. You can integrate them out and then see their effects in an effective way coming to kind of your low energy theory that you have to deal with. The problem with that is that generically introduces higher order terms. And every problem I, reached, I alluded before will show up in even a worse fashion. So we're, we seem to be stuck here. But this is, ideally, we would like to have something like this. We think there is an underlying theory, which no one has written, has written yet. Every single theory that has been written so far is some form of a truncation, either because you chose to stay at second order 
because you do the, the DDFT and truncate it at some, at some order. But this, I tell you, with a very, very, very small set of exception, uh, is sick, is pathological. So somehow you want to fix this problem to try and ask questions to this theory, which hopefully will infer, will inform you something about this underlying theory, which after all, you want to ask data to guide you what and how to write this one. Again, this is like starting beyond standard model physics in particle physics, but with the problem that our problems are evolutionary in nature. We want to study something that will take a very long time to manifest its changes, and we need to have control from the very beginning, t equals to zero, all the way to the end of the system that we care to study. So what do people do? So he, the first thing we do, or people have done, and I actually uh, have a slight problem with that, is people go and talk to particle physics, which is fine. They know what to do. They, they have done it a long time with scattering matrices as well. You have this new correction. Just compute it, the interaction with the other correction, put that into the higher order terms that you might uh, be dealing with, and then iterate. And then typically this, this is just fine. No one guarantees that that makes sense for a partial differential equation. In fact, there are even counterexamples in ODE. Of course, this we do this with the, uh, trying to uh, evaluate the Abraham Lorentz electromagnetic interactions all the time, but there is no guarantee. So we have to keep that in mind. But people are using that. So the idea is that, well, you have a theory that looks like this. So in the left hand side, it's your Einstein's equation. In the right hand side, it's a mess. Com higher order terms of curvature, et cetera. And so you solve initially answer the equation, you plug the solution to the right hand side, and then you keep iterating. And this is something that people are doing, they're investigating, I'm very happy they are doing that. Um, but we may consider a, an alternative idea. This is something that we're working with. You can say, well, take your original theory, introduce a new variable, I'm gonna call f, is for everything else, and force that f to have a solution, evolution that you put by hand. I mean, I'm not gonna oversell this claim such that you try and make it be so higher frequency, short wavelength, uh, most of the solutions are controlled. So I'm gonna control that piece of the initial data that is over there that's gonna take my solution to, to hell so that I can study the bulk or the low, the, this regime that I'm really interested in. And at the end of the day, I want a method where I can ask where this kind of, some externally added parameters which control how much I'm controlling the higher fre the frequencies how much the solution depends on that. And if it's very sensitive on my ad hoc prescription, then I know that I couldn't trust that answer. I should say, this is not a new idea. This is a very, uh, this is, it was motivated by a, an, an older idea by Israel and Stewart to study relativistic hydrodynamics, which has exactly the problems I mentioned. So I'm not gonna give you all the details, but if you study relativistic hydrodynamics, you have, say for a perfect fluid, everything is fine, the conservation, Laws derived for a, for a perfect fluid tensor, stress energy tensor, give you hyperbolic equations and everything is fine. The moment you add vis viscosity in your problem or dissipation, then these terms now folded in into evolution equations give you tachyons, give you instabilities, and nothing makes sense. So Israel and Stewart introduced a very similar idea to the one I just described, where you kind of encode these gradient terms into a new variable and you force this variable to decay in a particular way at high frequencies, but at low frequencies you're not doing anything. You still are recovering the, the behavior you expected. So that gives, opens the door to, eat. so I claim that I, I'm, I'm trusting my, our method, um, but if either one works, then this is a way to at least start probing these theories that are mathematically, as I said, pathologically sick. This mathematically rigorous argument that the system, the equations are sick, make impossible the quest of using numerical simulations to explore these theories. So you need something at the practical level to try and ask, ask questions. And I'll show you one example, because this was just too vague, but let me give you a very specific example. Because after all, as I said before, we, no one has this underlying theory, so we're pretty much uh, working under very, very uh, dubious foundations. We have a truncated theory that is sick. You want to find, somehow find a way to obtain solutions and inform you to the under, about the underlying theory. So let me try and motivate this with a good example where the underlying theory is known. Take this theory, which includes two scalar fields, rho and theta. This comes from a Mexican hat potential and a complex scalar field. Those are details. 
if I give you this, this Lagrangian, where one of the fields, V, a row, is sensible to a potential, which I'm writing this way, you, I can ask you, this is a full theory, what are the equations of motion? And a very simple exercise uh, will give you this equation of motion, at which is the box equations for the field row, and our box equation for the field theta, and some non-trivial interaction between these two fields. But the important message is that at this level, you can ask, how will these two fields propagate? They both propagate at this, al along the null cones of the flat spacetime. But now you can say, well, I, this field rho feels this potential. It's pretty much at the bottom of the potential. has a hard time moving away from that bottom of the potential. Maybe I can iterate it out and eliminate it from my, from my problem. And indeed, you can do that. When you iterate out this field rho, you put, plug that solution into the original action, you end up with this action now. So you have, again, the gradient square part of this, of this scalar field theta. But now they have error, other interactions. So these are the effective interactions that come out because of this degree of freedom associated to rho that you de decided to iterate out. So this is what naturally happens in the EFT. But the problem is that once you have to work with this theory, well, let's, the equations of motion are to live, living order in this kind of coupling constant now m. You have the wave equation for a scalar field. And sorry, theta morphs into phi in just one line. That was that's my bad. Uh, you have the wave equation for the, the field equal to zero. And uh, next order, you have something more complicated. And the first thing you notice here is that the equations of motion will now be dependent on the gradient of this field itself. So an a, a problem that initially had no, the, no sensitivity to any behavior of the field itself, the propagations were the, the speed of light. Now the sign now begins to propagate at the speed given by the gradient of itself. So at this order, we had no shocks. When we consider this order, all the sudden shocks come about. And if you want to go to the next order, OK, it begins to be a very complicated thing. So we can try and ask the question, let's put face to face these two potential methods, the reduction of order method motivated by particle physics, or this kind of fixing of the equations method motivated by relativistic hydrodynamics. And if this scale is not very strong, they both do quite well. So here we have our, the, the, the fortunate fact that at our disposal we have the full solution. And we can then also solve the truncated problem. Let's say just stick to this one. And then we can compare the solutions for the field theta here, with those that would have been the true solutions of the, our original problem. So for the scales that are weak enough, things are fine. Both methods more or less give the same thing. But as soon as you increase the strength a little bit, the reduction of order method stops making sense, doesn't give you the right answer, and at some point doesn't even give you an answer. So the bottom line is, I do think, and of course I'm, I'm selling you our method, but I'm, I'm, that's not my point. The point is I do think that if you have a theory and you want to explore the nonlinear regime, in spite of me having said, I think generically, by and large, most theories have problems, I still don't know that if you're going to be studying configurations around, say, this particular set of initial data, where that theory will give you a good answer. And with methods like this, you could begin to probe that question. And that may be enough. That may be what you want. So the idea is that if you use at least that option, which is the one I, I believe, there is a way to fix whatever extension to GR you love and begin to ask questions, and then use data to inform whether this is worthwhile doing uh, with respect to potential observations of, by LIGO or by cosmological uh, service. So this is an example which are, we're about to put out uh, where we started this theory. So it's the, re, the Einstein's plus corrections that come with the Riemann tensor to the fourth power. This is a very, very kind of messy thing to do, but you can actually use the method I mentioned, control all the high frequency problem, and find out how, say, a quasi normal mode of black hole uh, is affected by this correction. So at this point, I think I'm, I'm, I'm essentially stopping. There's lots of discuss, and, and the discussions are of many, many types. From a point of view of uh, trying to modify generativity, well, many people have different tastes. The, the very fact that we don't have a one or two or three uh, prefer uh, formulations 
as an extension of generativity is just a reflection of how many good or interesting ideas are out there. Very few people, by and large, work on theories that have not even either been developed by themselves or developed by someone close to themselves, which again shows that there is no compelling reason to study anyone in particular. So it ultimately, I think, is up to those that develop those ideas or those that are interested in studying particular theories to try and, and, and make headways and ask for how to obtain potential predictions for uh, the use of LIGO. I'll give you one example which, uh, to some degree, drives me insane. Typical examples you get in extensions of theory of generativity, people go and say, well, what's the analog of short solution? I'm going to assume that the solution is stationary and find a solution and show, look, this is a black hole. I don't know if that black hole is stable. This is like in Newtonian theory, someone writing a, the, the solution of a pen standing on its tip and trying to give it to LIGO and say, look, this is a theory you should explore. If that solution is unstable, nature wouldn't have produced it. It wouldn't have been involved in a binary black hole collision. So someone, those that are proponents of these theories, should do more than just saying, look, there is an interesting black hole solution. Um, there, one has to be especially aware that there are problems both when high, higher derivatives are, are, are introduced, but also even restricting to second order uh, theories, especially if you talk with people in the cosmological front, they think second order is fine. The, the, having Kilo Strogarski's uh, goes is enough. And we can show explicitly that it's not. Um, with respect to effective field theory, well, there is a very interesting, that's a very interesting tool to try and explore what sort of modification of generativity one should uh, be uh, trying to ask. But I think there is a lot of, there is a potentially a lot of input that we should be getting from quant people that are supposedly working on quantum gravity. And I actually get personally very annoyed when I get, and I'm not gonna say the theory, when I have people tell me this XXX theory is the only consistent of theory of quantum gravity we have. And when I ask the question, well, if that's true, what, should the th what is this theory telling me about the semi-classical regime? And they tell me, ah, we don't know. Okay, then I don't know what the first statement meant. So I keep pushing my friends who belong to that camp that says this is the only th consistent theory of quantum gravity we have to tell me what should be the leading order correction terms to the Einstein uh, Lagrangian. Um, and then what else? No, I think I'm going to ask. I'm going to just conclude to say, saying, even though I, I have spent like 45 minutes throwing garbage at extensions of generativity, I don't mean that. What I really mean is I think there is a lot of work, a lot of opportunities, and now we have at least some potential ways forward we should be considering, and it's for the, I'm going to reiterate one more, once more, for the young people in the audience, fortunately or unfortunately, that involves numerical simulation, so make sure you learn how to do that. Thank you. So why would we ever study a truncation if the correction is not small? If the correction is small, we understand what we are doing. As soon as it's not small, we should just not do it, right? Why are we studying a, a truncation if the terms we are throwing away are as big as the ones we are keeping? So let's see, there's, I think there are two, two levels to, the, to answering that question. So in principle, you think those terms are small. What I, guarantee, what I can guarantee is if the PDEs are the ones that these, are, these natural truncations are giving you, it turns out that what your, your intuition, coming more from the particle physics front, is, well, I, I, I know that I should be far from the cutoff scale. There's a cutoff scale, I better not be there. But numerically, once you put, so you can define, so a Gaussian, let's say a very, very smooth Gaussian has a given wavelength that is very comfortable within the regime of probability, that's perfectly fine in, in, a, in analytical land. In numerical land, you're putting a Gaussian with a tiny, with a whole bunch of high frequencies. That's going to kill you, because the theory says every time you have that, in arbitrary short amount of time, even when you can, these little wiggles have arbitrarily small amount of energy, they will take off arbitrarily fast. So this very practical way, kind of this ad hoc way of addressing this is, I'm going to just make sure I can control that, so that I can begin to ask a question. Because if I don't do that, I don't even. I cannot even ask the question that you really want me to answer, which is, is what happens if I have a smooth Gaussian? 
But you agree that uh, we can only, it only makes sense to study these theories uh, if absolutely. they are a small correction to GR. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense to take them as fundamental Yeah, 100% agree with that. But, we, but, but so where I say we do need a method that lets us even ask that question. And if the answer to that question is, it's extremely sensitive on this, even though you started with a Gaussian, it goes away, and I say, well, that's not a theory describing nature. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then, for example, for the last class of theories that you were describing, which are these Riemann to the four corrections, then those coefficients are small, the coefficients of all these Riemanns, right? You could, in co principle, theoretically study them as big, but... Right, and, and we, so let's say... You let's have to take them as to be Yeah, let small. me give you a, a very particular example. So let's take that theory. Those, th those terms should be small, well, and I'm going to give you the, data, the same data that we know for a fact make flat, I Minkowski mean, stable in general activity. So you would expect those terms are small, they will stay small, and you're going to converge to flat space-time analytically. You try to study that numerically, and you're going to go to hell. Because this high-frequency regime that you're feeding numerically, the problem is that the tool, were, the tool for the job is not the ideal tool, but it's the yeah. only one we have. So somehow we need to control these to then show that, oh, if we have something smooth, those terms aren't small, and we stay small, and we're fine. And so then I said, this method introduces a a, an arbitrary scale, which is a scale at which you're controlling those frequencies. If your solution depends very sensitively on that scale, then you're saying, okay, this, this, is, not, this is not true. This cannot be representative of nature. And people using the Israel Stewart formulation he, to study quark gluon plasma in, uh, in uh, colliders, they do precisely this. They, they use this theory. There is an ad hoc term there that governs what happens in the high frequency, and if the solution depends very sensitively on that, then say, okay, I cannot trust this anymore. It's so just a general comment. Of course, whatever theory it is, doesn't matter. The answer is the, f the term with the fewest derivatives is the one that shows up at low energy. That's effective field theory. I mean, sure. doesn't that, matter what theory what it is. It's strict theory, any theory. It's the same. So it just tell me which one. Just to try to understand your provocation. Suppose XXX is string theory. So. Let's imagine. I okay, don't know okay. why, but let's um, So in 10 dimensions, I mean, Michael Green showed exactly. what the effective action right. is. I understand. So when you compactify, of course, that's, that's the part that's unknown. But right. is, that, is that how you understand? That's what I want. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You so want no, the compactification. So I was very interested in, in, in the first talk, but I want to know, okay, what happens when I compactify? Yeah, yeah, that, that's unknown. But I don't know why in this time and age, why a very big chunk of, let's say, this theory, XXX theory, of practitioners of that theory are not stopping everything and saying, I need to answer that question because LIGO is, is coming up with data every other week. So people have tried. It's not that people haven't tried, but. You're going to constrain it. I mean, people, people tried and didn't succeed. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just as a sort of, if, to me, a lot of what you said is basically a heuristic statement of renormalization. What you call instabilities is basically high frequency modes and low frequency modes sure. mixing. What you call Israel Stewart, that hoc thing, is cutoff independence, is what the renormalization theorists call cutoff independence. And of course, gravity is a non renormalizable, gravity is a non renormalizable theory, so the set of measure zero is your extensions of general relativity, right? I mean, this yeah. is... Is there something more rigorous that can be said about it? Has there been a dictionary between renormalization group type physics and the numerical no, no, instability? People, people are beginning to, to, to think about it in these terms, mm -hmm. but I think there, is, there are not enough people on the renormalization group theory front, let's say, that have come into this, into this corner uh, to give their input nor there are enough people, and I think there is very few people, in the standard classical GR world that know even this, this terminology. I, mean, I, I only know this deep. Because Israel, I can tell you that with Israel Stewart, there are insights. One of them is this Ostrogra is connected to Ostrogratsky thing, but uh, uh, there, was, there were recent papers. In Israel Stewart, you have insights from, if you want renormalization group theory sure. as to why that term is sort of better than other ones. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. so there, is this, there, is, there was this series of results by Gerog. I mean, that, those terms, fine. But if the particular ad hoc prescription that you introduce is very, the, or your prescription is very sensitive on the extra equation that you add ad hoc, then it's already saying, OK, this is very sensitive. So yeah. 
the argument is that it shouldn't depend very sensitively on how you do it. And if it does, it's already telling you something. Sure. That's, yeah, that's renormalization right. in other words. That's a quick question. So um, I'm working uh, in experiments, right? And we, we try to go beyond general relativity, but in a very phenomenological way, namely changing the Poisson equation and changing the difference between phi and the Newtonian potentials. Of course, uh, this is, this, there's no deep theory behind this, right? So I want to know your opinion about this. This is purely phenomenology. And this to see how the growth of structures change and... Uh... I, th I think this is fine. LIGO does some of these to some degree. You take, say, the post approximation that has very specific coefficient, pr predictions for the coefficient in the expansion. And so, well, now let that, this vary arbitrarily. The, the only counterpoint of that is, that, fine, you can do it, but as you know well, it's suboptimal with respect to the type of analysis we'll do. And if that's fine, then that's great. The situation is now, the SNR is, is not that high, and maybe the, the, this is going to Pedro's comment, maybe the size of the coefficient is very small, and the best you could do is put a constraint. So eventually we want to go there, and it's gonna take a long time, but okay, there's lots of experiments going in the poll. You wouldn't know the basic theory behind That's right, that's the main, that's the main um, thing that would leave you with a bad taste, but okay, if that is the way to go, fine. But, and there are other people that are really good at thinking about well, how to look for extensions and building theories where you slowly kind of say, I'm going to give up this. I'm just like, there's the, the Horoshava lifted, right? I'm going to leave, uh, give up Lorentz invariance. And so then some theory comes out. I mean, there are interesting things to say, well, at least we know to this regime, at this level, Lorentz invariance is respected. There, there, are, there, is, there is work for everyone. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank Luis again.